we're graphing our sine and cosine functions here, and these are the parent functions which are based off of the unit circle. We're using the quadrant angles only as our critical values to plot these five points, one, two, three, four, and then back again to five. That way we're traversing through each quadrant. So we're not really worrying about any of the points that we've learned about on the unit circle between those quadrant angles. So with a function, remember you need an input and an output. So our input, it says x, but remember our input is an angle of rotation. So if you like, you could call that sine of theta if that helps you recognize that we need an angle. So zero pi is our angle of rotation. The output then is the y coordinate. We said sine is paired up with y, so zero then. At pi over two radians, the output is one. So you can see I kind of spread my vertical axis so that we just would have more room to graph. We didn't have to make it quite that tall, but we just didn't want it to be too small. At pi, the y is zero. At three halves pi, the y is negative one. And back to two pi, where the y is zero. So these are the five critical points, and you, you need to memorize the shape of that so that we can graph these sine functions by hand. We connect those dots with the smooth curve, and there it is, okay? So that's our sh shape of the sine curve, and that's just one cycle. So if we were to copy that and paste it, this would represent going around the circle twice. If we were to go around the circle in a clockwise direction, so we would have a negative angle of rotation, and that's what you're seeing over here if we were to put it like this. So you see this negative pi over 2 that indicates we're rotating clockwise down to this angle here. So that's the y coordinate of negative 1. And then at, neg at, at negative pi, at the y coordinate is 0 again. So kind of retracing our steps. There's now two cycles. All right, so what you have from here to here is the length of one cycle. And sometimes we'll refer to that as one period. That describes the length from start to finish. And we're taking that and dividing it into half. And each of those halves are being divided into half again. And so that's where you see the tick marks represented on the scale, which represent the quadrant angles. Mm -hmm. Since we have uh, five of these, one, two, three, four, five, we have four quadrants that we're representing so this is the quadrant one information, this is quadrant two on the unit circle, this is quadrant three, and this is quadrant four. So each of these we call very casually the jump. That's not an official name, but what we're saying is we're jumping from one quadrant angle to the next quadrant angle. So these are all the same size because they are equally spaced apart. So what I'm calling the jump here is perhaps better described as the interval. That's the interval between those critical points. The critical points on the sine curve, or you could think of it as the interval between the quadrant angles. This is also then the scale that we use. So when we calculate this jump, this interval, it will also tell us what scale to use on the graph itself. So we're actually manipulating the scale when we graph these. Here, running right through the center, halfway between the top and halfway between the bottom. That is called our axis, which is also sometimes referred to as the midline because it's in the middle, halfway between the top and the bottom. So that means this distance to that maximum point, that's the amplitude. This is uh, created by the vertical stretch or vertical shrink. In the same way, you can go down to the minimum point, that is also the amplitude. And notice that the amplitude is always positive. Because it's describing a distance here. Even if we have a negative y coordinate, the amplitude is always positive because it's the same distance above and below. All right? So what that means for us here, we're going from 0 to 2 pi to represent one cycle. So the period is 2 pi. But the domain isn't just 0 to 2 pi, because we could go around the unit circle many times in either direction, so the sine curve could go indefinitely. So the domain is all real numbers. 
the range that describes the outputs. So we have everything from negative one up to positive one. And that's because the radius on the circle is one. So if we had a bigger circle, we would have a bigger range. Now what we notice, we, we've talked in the past about even and odd functions. Notice that this sine curve is what we call an odd function. That's what it's talking about down here. And an odd function means it has a certain kind of symmetry. It has rotational symmetry. All right, so if we were to take this and rotate it around the origin, you would uh, discover that it maps onto itself like that. Yeah, so that's rotational symmetry there. That's what we describe as an odd function. Our cosine graph then, cosine is paired up with x. Now remember, this x is not the x coordinate. This is the input. The input is always an angle of rotation. The output is the x coordinate on the unit circle. So at 0 pi, we have an x coordinate of 1. So our first point gets plotted here. At pi over 2, the x coordinate is 0. At pi, the x coordinate is a negative 1. At uh, 3 halves pi, the x coordinate is 0. And at 2 pi, the x coordinate is 1 again. So notice what we have is a V shaped pattern. Don't make it with a sharp point. You want to give it a little bit of a flare here to make sure that it looks like a curve and not just a point, okay? Kind of like a vase. So that's the difference between the five critical values that we see from the sine function versus the cosine function and the pattern is what we need to memorize. So if we were to copy this and go around the circle again, it would just extend this way. If we were to go the other way around the circle, well then it would look like this and that would give us our second function there. Something like that. All right, so again, we have this one period, this one cycle, and again, that's a length of 2 pi. The domain, again, is all real numbers because we can go around the unit circle any number of times, and the range is from negative to positive 1. All right, now this does not have rotational symmetry, right? Because if you rotate it around the origin, it does not map onto itself. It has a different kind of symmetry. And an even function has what we call a reflection about the y-axis. So there we are. We just flipped it over the y-axis and it mapped onto itself. So that's the behavior of an even function. When we graph these by hand, this little box here, this is your toolbox. This will save your life because it will tell you how to do everything. This is how you find the amplitude. It's the vertical stretch. It's the absolute value of A. B and C, they're the horizontal stretch or shift and they are found inside the grouping symbols. So notice that the A and the D affect your vertical position. They are outside the grouping symbols. B and C affect the horizontal. So the horizontal is indicating not just where you start, but also the length of that period. So we take 2 pi and we divide it by B. That then influences what that interval is between each of those critical values. So we take the result of the period and divide that into four equal parts. To find the starting point and the stopping point of our cycle, we'll take everything that's in parentheses and set it equal to zero because that's where our sine and cosine functions normally start. And to figure out where they stop, same procedure, but this time we set it equal to 2 pi because that's where the sine and cosine functions normally stop. That axis or that midline is a horizontal line, so y equals some number, and that number is the value of d. Once we get all of the numbers, then we'll assemble them in this order and we'll graph by starting with the midline then the amplitude, then the starting and the stop points. And those three steps there kind of create a box that will fit our cycle inside. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. All right, so again, that information from the previous page is what we're using on how we find these values, but I'm just going right through so I don't have to flip my paper back and forth all the time. Uh, well, let's start off with this one. So the function is 3 times sine of x over 2. All right? This is not quite in the standard form. We want the value of b in front, and it's not in front. It looks like it's underneath. Okay, So think about this. If it's x divided by 2, then that's the same as half of x. So we're rewriting this. We're reformatting it as 1 half of x.
That's what you want. So you have to be careful here because you might think that the value of b is just a 2. It's not a 2. It's 1 half because we were dividing by 2. All right? So a is 3, b is 1 half, we don't have a c, we don't have a d in this case. Our amplitude is always the absolute value of a. So absolute value of 3 is just 3. The period, remember that's 2 pi divided by the value of b. Well, b is 1 half. So that means we have to take 2 pi and multiply it by the reciprocal, which gives us 4 pi. So notice, this is not a horizontal shrink. It's not half the size. It's actually a doubler because we divided by a fraction. So it's being stretched out, 4 pi radians. We take that result and cut that into four equal parts. And this is, again, the jump or the interval. Here it's labeled as the scale. So on your horizontal axis, you can see are these tick marks already. That's where we'll place them so we can fit this in nicely, counting in terms of a pi. So 1 pi, 2 pi, and so on. If we were to go backwards, you'd have a negative pi, negative 2 pi, and so on. To figure out the start and the stop, you take everything that's in the parentheses, and I'll use this format here, x over 2, and you set that equal to wherever your sine curve normally starts, and it normally starts at 0. We want to solve for x. Let's multiply both sides by 2 to get x by itself, and it's still at 0. So this means there is no horizontal shift. Notice we do have a horizontal stretch, but we don't have a horizontal shift. Then to figure out where we stop, again, take that same information, the x over 2, and we ask ourselves, where does the sine curve normally stop on its parent function? That's at 2 pi. We set this equal to 2 pi, and then solve for x. So multiply both sides by 2, and we get a result of 4 pi. Now, if you start at 0 and you stop at 4 pi, that should agree with the period length that we calculated previously, which it makes sense. If you start at 0 and go to 4 pi, that's a total of 4 pi radians. So yeah, that checks out. Lastly, the value of d tells us where our midline is, which in this case is just 0. So there's no vertical shift, neither up nor down. So now we're going to assemble these numbers into our graph. So step number one is to determine your midline. There it is. Drawing that with a dashed line because it's just a reference line. You know what? We need a vertical scale, don't we? Let's go by ones. Okay. So we got the midline down there. We then check the amplitude, which is three. So we're counting three above and three below. So three above and then three below. This is where we will find the maximum and the minimum points. <clears throat> and that's what you see here. So the minimum point will be at somewhere here on negative three. And the maximum point will be somewhere here on positive three. Okay, so this is the corridor through which we're gonna see the sine curve. Now we're gonna start at zero and stop at four pi. So if you use these as guides, this is what I refer to as the box. This is the box that represents the placement of one cycle. So if we wanted more cycles, we could just copy that box endlessly on either side. We'll just draw one in this case. We want our sine curve, and so we want to remember, what is the pattern of those five dots? We start at the midline, go up to the maximum, back to the midline, down to the minimum, and then back to the midline. That's the pattern of the five. So my first dot has to be where I'm starting. I'm starting at zero. So at zero pi, my output is a zero. So then we jump to the next interval. So at pi, I need to be at the maximum point. We jump to the next interval and back to the midline. We jump again, we're down to the minimum. We jump again. And notice we've stopped at 4 pi. We have our 5 points, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's our graph. Um, many books and many teachers will say always draw two cycles. Uh, here we're just representing one because the idea is you could copy and paste this endlessly to get however many cycles you wanted. All right, so that was sine. Let's take a look at an example of cosine. So here with cosine we have... 3 times the cosine of 2x minus pi and a minus 2. So the a is the 3, 
2 is b, c is the negative pi, and negative 2 <coughs> for the d. All right, so our amplitude is 3. The period is 2 pi divided by the value of b. Choose cancel out, so pi is the length of the cycle. Take that result and divide it into four equal parts. That will be our scale. So on our tick marks, let's use fourths of a pi. So one fourth, two fourths it reduces to half of a pi. Three fourths, four fourths is one pi. Uh, five fourths pi, and then six fourths pi reduces to three halves pi. And again, if we went in the opposite direction, we would have negative one-fourth pi, negative pi over two, and so on, with zero in the middle. All right, where do we start? We take everything in the parentheses, 2x minus pi, and we set that equal to zero, because that's where cosine normally starts. Add pi to both sides, so 2x equals pi, and then divide away the two. So we are starting at pi over two. Notice we do have a horizontal shift here because if cosine normally starts at zero, our graph is not starting at zero. No, it's been shifted to the right. Where does it end? Take the 2x minus pi, set that equal to 2 pi because that's where cosine normally stops. Let's solve for x. Add pi to both sides. So 2x equals 3 pi. Divide away the 2 and we get 3 halves pi as a result. Lastly, the midline is the value of d. That's a horizontal line, so y equals negative 2. So we're shifting it down two spaces. Let me put a vertical scale. Again, I'm counting by ones. We start graphing by putting the midline on there. That's at negative 2. And then the amplitude is 3 above and 3 below that. So 1, 2, 3. That means my maximum points are somewhere here on 1. And three below, our minimum points are here at negative five. So this is the corridor through which we're going to see the cosine curve. We start at pi over two, which is here. And we stop at three halves pi, which is here. So this is the box that we're using. That's where one cycle will occur. So let's think about what is the pattern for cosine. This... is the V-shaped pattern, like so. All right, so our very first point will start at the maximum. So we're starting at pi over two, so we're starting here. And my maximum point is here in this top left corner. We jump to the next interval, we're on the midline. We jump to the next interval, we're on the bottom. And then work our way back upwards again finishing in that top right corner. So there's that V-shaped graph. Again, give your graph a little bit of a flare here so that it doesn't look like a pointed V, but there it is. So that means our minimum points is occurring here at negative five, and our maximum is at one. Now, the only thing we haven't seen so far is what if we have a reflection, right? We've had A, B, C, and D represented. We've got everything there. What if we're flipping it upside down? That would show up if you have a negative sign in front, right? If you have a negative in front, you still have a positive amplitude of 3. So it's not a negative 3, it's still a positive 3. But we would take that negative sign and flip this pattern upside down. So if that was the case, you would figure out where your five points are normally positioned and then flip it upside down, which means it would be a mountain shape. So, for example, if we were to take this... If we're going to flip it upside down, you have to uh, reflect it about that midline. Don't use the normal horizontal axis on the graph paper. You have to use the midline. If you were to try to reflect it over this line here, the horizontal axis, then that means your curve is now outside the box, and so that's in the wrong spot. What we want to do instead is reflect it over the midline so that it is still inside the box and that's what it looks like. So your first point is in the bottom left corner, your next point is on the midline, your third point is at the top, your fourth point is in the, on the midline, and your last point is in the bottom right corner. So that's what it would look like if we had a reflection. Here's our last example, just to give one other feature here that you'll see in a moment when we calculate the period. <clears throat> 
All right, so we have an A of 2. B is, there it is, pi over 4. Now, we have this plus 1, so the question is, does that belong to C or does that belong to D? Remember, C must be found inside the parentheses, but there are no parentheses. So that implies only this first term is in parentheses, therefore, D is 1. Amplitude is absolute value of 2. The period is 2 pi divided by b. Notice our b is pi over 4. Check out what happens here. So we have to multiply by the reciprocal, so 4 over pi. And that means the pi's cancel out. 2 times 4 is 8. What does that mean? Remember, we're not graphing with an angle of rotation in degrees, right? We're always using radians. Oftentimes our radians are in terms of pi but they don't have to be. This is just a, precisely a radians. That's just all it means, okay? We're going to take that result and divide it by four, and that means our scale is two radians. So we're going to count by twos. Notice the pi symbol is gone. So that happens on some of our problems. I just wanted to show you what that looked like. To find our start, we take everything in the parentheses, the pi over four x, set that equal to zero, and solve. We get zero. So there is no horizontal shift. Take the pi over 4x, set that equal to 2 pi, multiply both sides by 4, so we get pi x equals 8 pi, and then divide pi from both sides, so x equals 8. Again, this should confirm what we saw earlier. If the period is 8 radians, then we should be finding 8 radians between the starting value of 0 and the ending value of 8. The midline then is one. So vertical shift up one. I'll go with ones on my scale. So the midline is at one. The amplitude is two, so two above and two below. That's the band through which we'll see the curve. We're starting at zero. We're stopping at eight. All right, so that's the box that we're using. And again, with the sine curve, we want to create our first point here on the midline. We jump to two radians, we're at the max. We jump to four radians, we're at the minimum. Excuse me, the midline again. Jump to six radians, now we're at the minimum. Jump to eight radians, we're back to the midline. There's our sine curve. So our minimum point occurs at negative one. Our maximum occurs at three. 